We are slightly early, but we're going to go ahead and get started with Dr. Yu's talk. She is going to talk about what's new or how to navigate research in Parkinson's disease. So, Dr. Yu. Thank you so much, Shannon, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Xinxin Yu, and I am a movement disorder fellowship trained neurologist. I specialize in Parkinson care and uh, also other movement disorders as well. And I have been with the Cleveland Clinic for the last 12 years, and it's a great honor to be here and to speak to you today about this important topic that often gives hope to Parkinson care. And, uh, and I really appreciate all of you still being here at the end of the day and, um, and also having the interest to, you know, to stay informed about Parkinson research as this is very important. And, um, and I, I just encourage those you know, in the back, if you have trouble seeing the slides, please feel free to come forward uh, and I won't bite. Um, so let me get this little button here. So some of you might ask, why research? So since the first description of Parkinson disease written by Dr. James Parkinson in 1817, uh, when he wrote the essay on the uh, shaking palsy, which we know now as Parkinson disease, since then there has been so much advancement and breakthroughs and new information about Parkinson that uh, we didn't know about. We have more medication available to us now than ever. We have more devices. You guys have probably heard about that in other sessions today. And more refined surgeries for Parkinson care. Our patients are living longer um, in, uh, you know, now than in the past before the, um, these newer medications and having a better quality of life now. But we also know that our work is not done. To simply put, we need a cure. We need to be able to detect Parkinson early. We need to find better treatments to improve and reduce symptoms such as motor symptoms, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson. And we also need treatments to help us to slow down or even stop the disease progression. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And we need everybody's help on this. Uh, research is truly a collaboration among scientists, clinicians, patients, family members. We need help from funding agencies, sponsors, and you know, different kind of research institutes. And this is really a work, working together kind of a project. And we know that in the last 25 years, the prevalence of Parkinson's disease has doubled. It has been projected that Parkinson, the number of people that are affected by Parkinson's disease is increasing at a speed that is faster than any other neurological disorder. So this is a really an urgent need. Now, I know that the research field when, we, when I was given this you know, topic, let's talk about research updates within 25 minutes. And I thought, oh my goodness, what, where do I start? There's so much. So if we have all the time in the world, I can probably talk about this hours on end with you. Since we have the limited time, I would like to focus um, today's talk on the drug-based therapies. So that means we will not have time to, you know, to cover um, other exciting things like research in biomarkers, research in devices, or research in other lifestyle interventions. But I hope that, again, you got some of that information at other uh, sessions today as well. So we know that Parkinson field is an ever-evolving uh, landscape. And to be honest, it can be very difficult to navigate as a patient and also um, a loved one just to figure out what's available, um, what might be a, a, a study that would be fitting for my situation right now. You know, there's so much information that you learn from you know, social media, from the journals, from just a lot of different places you can look now. So my goal today is to provide you 
some clarity on kind of the current research um, directions and help you to familiarize with some of the terminologies in research and also to empower you. I think this is the most important, is to empower you to feel comfortable when speaking about research opportunities with your healthcare providers in your office visits. So I know that information can be overwhelming, so I try to break it down to smaller and digestible pieces today. And um, so let's get going here. I'd like to introduce you to this um, article that was just published earlier this year. And this is an annual report. And as you can see, this is a 2023 update. So there was a 2022, 2021, and 2020. And uh, so this is an annual report on the clinical development of new drug-based therapy uh, for Parkinson. So as of January 31st, 2023, and this is th um, this particular report was looking at, and uh, it looked at what was published on the clinicaltrials.gov. How many of you are familiar with that website? Some of you, I see your hands raised, great. So clinicaltrials.gov is actually an open access website. Um, public can, you know, have free access to it and you can see, um, you can actually search for any kind of disease entity. You know, if you type in Parkinson um, or, you, you know, if you're interested in diabetes uh, research, you can also utilize that website as well. And all the research, the clinical trials, um, um, are um, registered in this website as they are starting to recruit, as they are being active, as they're you know, being closed. So this is a really important resource and very helpful resource for you to take a look. So this report was looking at all the studies, the clinical trials that's registered on this website as an active trial for a specific drug-based therapy for Parkinson, and there was a total of 139 clinical trials that were active at that time. And the graph that you can see over there shows all the agents that were being tested in each clinical trial phase. So about half of the studies were in phase two. And a third of the uh, uh, studies were in phase one, and the remaining 14% were in phase three. I know that uh, some of you might be very familiar with all the different phases and some of you might not be, so I wanna make sure that we um, clarify that so that we are on the same page. So clinical trials um, are research studies that test new medication, new device, new intervention on people, on humans. And they typically consist of these several phases. Phase one is the very first step. This is where a small group of healthy volunteers receive the treatment to try to assess, is it safe? And what's the safe dose? And are there any potential side effect? So if the treatment passes the phase one, then it moves on to phase two with a larger group of patients. Um, and the goal here is to further evaluate, is it effective, is it safe, and what are the side effects? Now, if phase two is successful, you, you get this um, idea here, then you move on to phase three. And phase three involves even larger group of patients, and this phase confirms the effectiveness of this intervention, and it continues to monitor any side effect that people may experience, and it compares with existing treatments that we have available. We want to understand, is this better than what we have now? Is it superior or is it about the same? Now, when it co goes to phase four, phase four, the, the drug, the intervention, whatever it is being tested, is already approved by FDA. So this is post-marketing study. So for phase two, uh, a phase four study, it continues to monitor long-term effects. So that means we're still looking at potential benefits and risk and over a long time and gather those information in real world setting. It's really important to remember that 
participating in clinical trial is completely voluntary. And patients um, are being closely monitored by a medical professional throughout this whole process. And having these phases really try to ensure that treatments are safe and effective before they are approved for widespread use. When we talk about drug-based therapies, there are different types of drug by um, uh, the drug types, uh, by how novel this drug is. Um, and this might be helpful for you to know. For example, a novel drug or a new drug means that it is something that has not been used in human before. So it typically starts in the laboratory. So it's first studied in the laboratory. So if it starts to show promising results, then it is carefully studied in humans. And the timeline when from the discovery of this um, agent in the laboratory to the time when you know goes through all the phases to when it's actually approved by FDA sometimes can take 10 to 15 years or more. A second type of drug trial is called repurposed drug. So a repurposed drug is a when a medication that is already approved to treat one condition and now is being tested to see if they help with a different condition. So one of the advantage, as you can imagine with this, is that it is a faster process for the clinical pro uh, um, uh, research process than testing a novel agent because there's already a great deal of data and knowledge about this repurposed drug. We already know how it works in the human and we wanna see if it would help with a different condition. So one example of the repurposed drug, some of you might be on a medication called amantadine, for example, amantadine for Parkinson's disease. I don't know if you're aware that amantadine was originally an antiviral medication used to treat influenza. And then subsequently, it was found that it actually helps with Parkinson's symptoms. So that was a repurposed drug. Now the third type of drug trial by how novel it is, is called reformulation. And I think that this is also a very common, you know, you may have already been aware of this type of um, uh, medication. For example, who doesn't know about carbidoblivodopa? Okay, good, I, I imagine that no one would raise their hand for this one. So carbidoblivodopa uh, was initially approved the immediate release formulation was approved back in 1970s. And since then, the reformulation efforts have really produced a number of other medications that are in the market now, such as the long-acting carbidopolivodopa, the time-release formulation, the Ritari uh, of carbidopolivodopa, and then there's gel, intestinal gel formulation, and there's inhaled you know, version, and they're being tested, you know, the subcutaneous. So all of these are reformulation of, of a drug that's already, um, already um, in place. And why do we do this? It's because we're looking for ways to help this drug to be absorbed in the most efficient way and to stay at a steady level in our bloodstream and in our brain to make sure that we address the problem of motor fluctuations, such as increasing the on time and reducing the off time. Now lastly, the, the last thing I have on this slide is called new claim. The new claim drug trial uh, refer to those medication, the Parkinson medicine that's already approved for one indication and now being tested for a different indication. So if something was used already for dyskinesia related to Parkinson, now we're trying to see if it would help with wearing off in Parkinson symptom management. So that is called a new claim. So now you're an expert in this, right? So let's look at why I mentioned this. So again, going back to that 2023 annual report, out of the 139 clinical trial that are labeled as active and, and are drug-based therapies, 41, close to 42% of the trials were testing new agents. They were testing novel agents. So th the novel drug represent the most dominant group of, this, um, of the study. 
And the second most common is the repurposed. So that means there is continued emphasis on testing repurposed agents being 35% of the active drug trials in the pipeline. And then the reformulation trials represent 19% and new claim represent 4%. Going back to this figure here, you might notice some abbreviations here, the ST and DMT. I want to be able to clarify what, the, what those mean. So ST stands for symptomatic therapy. DMT stands for disease modifying therapy. So of the 139 active trials, 55% were considered symptomatic therapies, and about 45% were considered disease-modifying therapies, so about half and half. So let's talk about these two subcategories, symptomatic versus disease-modifying. So what, what do they mean? How are they different? So as the name suggests, symptomatic therapy target treating the symptoms of Parkinson. So that could be motor symptoms or non-motor symptoms. And disease-modifying therapy are trying to aim to change the disease process. So either stopping the progression of disease or slowing down. Before we can better understand the, um, the subcategories under each therapy, um, we need to go back to the basics. Who can tell me what this structure, this molecular structure is? Just shout out, feel free. Take a wild guess. Yes, dopamine. Great. Um, we really cannot not talk about Parkinson without talking about dopamine, right? So, yes, great job. And um, so dopamine, it's a neurotransmitter we all have in our brain, in our guts. And this neurotransmitter is classically involved in um, our brain's reward center. But it is also an important, it serves an important role in many other body functions, including our movement, our mood, our memory, our attention, and, uh, and others as well. Now, we know that Parkinson's disease results from loss of dopamine, which then produce, you know, the problems with mobility, the tremors, the rigidity, the slowing. But we also discover that Parkinson's disease is not just about dopamine loss. There are other neurotransmitters that are involved, and here are some of them, uh, including serotonin, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, NMDA, et cetera. As Parkinson's disease progressed through different stages, we are recognizing that there are non-dopamine pathways are involved. And, and, and that can affect many of the non-motor symptoms that people experience, um, such as GI issues or you know, constipation, bladder symptoms, uh, mood symptoms, memory issues, et cetera that can either start prior to the symptom of motor or during or after the onset of the motor symptoms. Here are the motor and non-motor symptom that some of the trials are targeting. So out of, again, the 139 tr active trials, 55% of them were trying to look at symptomatic therapies. And, um, and, and you can see from this graph, most of them are targeting, um, so the first line is the motor symptoms. So most of the symptomatic treatment were trying to target the motor symptoms. And that could include things like dyskinesias, the motor fluctuation, the gait and balance issues. But there are also other studies, as you can see, that's looking at treatment for different non-motor symptoms that we mentioned earlier. Pain, anxiety, apathy. Apathy means loss of motivation or loss of initiative. 
um, constipation, dysphagia means trouble swallowing, hallucination, sleep, urinary symptoms. So again, you can see how things are divided there. So again, majority of the symptomatic treatment uh, in terms of the active clinical trials that are happening are uh, dedicating a lot of energy on trying to figure out how we can best improve the motor symptom while there are also the non-motor symptom studies um, out there as well. Now we know that Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative process, which means that there is this gradual loss of brain cells Researchers are diving deep into figuring out the mechanism of Parkinson's disease to shed some light to, to help us to figure out how we can slow down or stop progression if we can find those upstream processes happening that eventually will create loss of dopamine. So one of the areas that are being studied heavily as part of the disease modifying strategy is looking at the alpha-synuclein. So let's spend a little bit of time on this alpha-synuclein protein. Alpha-synuclein protein um, is a protein that is actually quite abundant in our nervous system. When it becomes a problem, it's actually, it's, it's clumping together um, and, and becomes Lewy body, and that is when it becomes toxic to the brain cell. So when they're not clumping together and become Lewy body, um, alpha synuclein has its own function in our nervous system. But as it tries to clump and, 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 and become this globular, round, um, pigmented um, uh, substance, as you can see um, in, the, in the figure there, um, that is called Lewy body, and it disrupts the normal brain function. And this is actually, you know, it start, you know, we ask the question about how do we break it down? How can we prevent the form, um, the formation of the Lewy body? How can we prevent that from clumping and how can we break that apart? And this is actually about a quarter of all the current disease modifying therapy studies is trying to look at different ways of targeting the alpha synuclein. And so I circle there, that is kind of the, the primary, um, a quarter of the studies are looking at that. But of course, there are other areas that are being investigated as part of the disease modifying therapy strategy, including looking at another important protein called LARC2 protein that's listed there, and then stem cell therapy, and others as well. And here is just a, um, a, um, a table showing kind of the completion status of these different disease modifying uh, trials. And, 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 and um, table six um, it are the ones that's already completed, and table seven shows there are ones that are expected to complete at the, by the end of the year. So this is really, um, you know, um, we're all looking forward to know the results of those studies. Now you may wonder, how do you get your feet wet in this? I would say start um, by talking to your neurologist um, and, and tell them about what you have learned so far, um, what you might be interested in, and what might you be eligible for. So in our clinic, we have this flow diagram, which makes things easier for us, for our patients, and for the providers as well, to work together to look at what would be the most suitable study to consider. I like to highlight just a th uh, few studies in our clinic that we're currently offering, that are currently available. I found these three uh, studies very interesting and, and, uh, and, and very um, uh, important to consider. So the first one, uh, this is Temple 2 study. This is a phase three trial, which means it's nearing the end of all the phases that we just talked about. And um, this is a symptomatic therapy trial meaning that the goal is to target the improving motor symptoms while minimizing side effect. And this, the test drug in this trial is a type of dopamine agonist. LUMA is a phase two trial. It's a disease modifying therapy trial. The goal is to stop or slow down the progression of disease. 
And this study is designed to try to affect the LARC2 protein I mentioned earlier, um, which is another important protein in the mechanism of Parkinson's disease. And this is for uh, folks with early stage Parkinson's disease. And the third one here is called STEN-PD. I know that we talk a lot about drug-based, but this is actually a device. It's a non-invasive device um, therapy. Um, people wear a kind of a music, um, it looks like a, a music earphone headset. Um, and, and this is a type of stimulation that it provides. And the, this is actually looking at improvement of non-motor symptoms, uh, while the secondary, um, uh, the secondary uh, endpoint is actually looking at whether it helps with motor symptoms as well. So it targets both non-motor and motor symptoms. And, um, and, and I thought this would be, you know, it would be good to bring this up as, you know, researchers are also looking at other innovative ways to look at how we can improve the care of our Parkinson patients. So I want to bring um, show this here so that you know how to get a hold of us if if, there, if there's anything you would like to kind of discuss um, offline uh, regarding different research trials that's available in Cleveland Clinic, and um, and. Um, the phone number there is 216-444-6626, and we have a dedicated research uh, group that, um, um, that will be able to provide you a lot more detailed information. And with that, I will end my talk, and I thank you so much for your attention. I hope that I gave you kind of an um, overall um, way of looking at um, clinical trials in general in terms of the drug-based therapies. As I know, this is such, a, um, such an area with lots of new information happening, and sometimes we lose the big kind of picture in terms of what we do and what are some you know, trajectories and directions in research where it goes. So I hope that brings you some clarity on that. And thank you so much for your attention. Good afternoon. The last session of today Ask the Parkinson's experts will be starting as soon as we can in room one. So please make your way to room one if you'd like to see the session. We will be starting it as soon as we can. Thank you so much.